Before we consider the Rutherford cross-section in its full generality, um, let's consider uh, the, just the simple kinematics in the limits where the alpha is much heavier than the target or in the limit when the, the projectile alpha is much lighter than, than the target. We'll do that by considering conservation of momentum and energy using the diagram uh, shown here. So initial uh, alpha is the projectile with its initial velocity hitting a target at rest and going into the alpha with its final velocity and the target velocity as so. So uh, conservation of momentum says that the mass of the alpha times its initial velocity is equal to the mass of the alpha times the final velocity of the alpha plus the mass of the target times the final velocity of the target. And if I divide through by m alpha, I find that vi equals vf uh, plus mt over m alpha vt. I can now square vi, uh, dotting it into itself, and so I want uh, to find, when I do that, I'll find that vi squared uh, equals vf squared plus mt over m alpha squared vt squared plus the cross product 2 mt over m alpha v final dot v target. Uh, and then I can do conservation of energy. Uh, I'm going to drop the factors of one half throughout since they're everywhere. And what I find is that m alpha vi squared equals m alpha v final squared plus mt vt squared. Again, I can divide through by m alpha and I find that vi squared is vf squared plus mt over m alpha vt squared. Now I have two equations for vi squared. I can set the right-hand sides of those equal to each other. And what I'll notice when I do that is that the, uh, the v finals uh, will cancel uh, and I can divide out by one factor of uh, v alpha over mt. Uh, and what I get, and then I want to collect all the factors of vt on one side. And what I find when I do that is that uh, vt squared times 1 minus mt over m alpha equals 2 v final dot vt. Okay, so now let me take, so I've, I've found all the factors of, I've put all the masses there, and so now let me take the, the two limiting cases uh, where, so if mt is much less than m alpha, then uh, the mt over m alpha term goes to zero, and I have that vt squared, which is positive, equals 2 vf dot vt. Since vf dot vt is positive, they both have to be going in the same direction, like so. So if the target is much less than, or yeah, if the target is much lighter than the projectile, the target's going to go off in the same direction, very close to the same direction as the uh, projectile will continue in. Now, if um, the mass of the target is much more than the mass of the alpha as a projectile, uh, then uh, the mass factor uh, dominates the one, I get rid of the one, divide through by m alpha over mt, and I find that vt squared equals minus 2 m alpha over mt v final dot v target. In this case, v final times v target has to be negative because vt squared is still 
a positive number. In that case, we have to have something like V final going in one direction backwards and V target in the other direction. And so we see that if things are bouncing back, it's pretty indicative of the fact that the target uh, must be heavier than the projectile. Okay, so normally when you do Rutherford scattering, classically you have uh, this diagram because you want to set it up in terms of the impact parameter onto some target. I should remind you that we're doing this is actually a one-dimensional problem. We use the reduced mass. If the target is much heavier than the projectile in any case, uh, that's a very small change. Um, and so the particle deflects through an angle theta. Um, so uh, this is just an orbital problem like you did in your intermediate mechanics class uh, that usually involves time derivatives and integrals, and then, but you're not usually interested in where the particle is at time, in time, but where it is in, as a function of angles. So there's a lot of back and forth you have to do. Should point out that this is still a central potential problem, so angular momentum is conserved. All the angle, all the action takes place in a plane uh, because of angular momentum conservation again. Uh, but I'll also point out that there's a symmetry axis, which is this axis here, uh, where the it, it's uniform, but it's not the axis of uh, the beam direction. So in this calculation, we emphasize the theta and the impact parameter b, but it obscures the change of momentum that the target particle undergoes. And so it's better to use a, or it's a more straightforward calculation to consider a case where we line up this delta p axis with the y axis. And so when we do that, we have a, a, an, um, a situation that looks like this. Now we've split the theta into a theta over 2 here and a theta over 2 there. We have this value phi, which measures where the particle is with respect to the y-axis. And we're going to use this terminology where the target has a charge uh, big Z times electron charge, and the projectile has a charge little z times z, uh, the projectile has a mass little m, the uh, target has a mass big M, though we're not going to use uh, big M because we're still going to do a one-dimensional problem. So um, in this case, let's we want to consider at minus infinity at the beginning of the, the problem, the, the target has a momentum which is just a mass times the velocity that v is going to be. Uh, its magnitude is what we're going to continue, continue just to have as, as v. Uh, and we can break that up into an x component, which is mv cosine theta over 2, uh, where again we've, we've split the theta deflection angle into the two parts. That's why it's theta over 2. And the y momentum then it's, is it's going down, so it's minus mv sine theta over 2. Uh, then, if we look at the end of the problem, so go to plus infinity, what we have is that px recovers its same value. It's not the same throughout, but at the end, it ends up being the same. And the y value has exactly reversed itself. So if we find the total change in momentum from minus infinity to plus infinity, what we find is that the total change in momentum is 2 mv sine theta over 2. Because we went from minus mv sine theta over 2 to plus mv sine theta over 2. Uh, we should write down a few other things for uh, our calculation. Uh, angular momentum is conserved, so angular momentum, which is p cross r. But uh, because the impact parameter is b, uh, we can easily do this and we find that this is MVB. Uh, and so we can also write uh, the delta P. If we look at the MV there, that's 2 times the angular momentum over the impact parameter. 
times sine theta over 2. Uh, we will also remember that the angular momentum in terms of this phi can be written as mr squared d phi dt. Right? It's, that's the angular speed. Sorry, I wrote d theta dt, d phi dt. Uh, and from that, it'll be useful to note what, how, because we're going to still do integrations in time, that uh, dt equals mr squared over L d phi or r squared over vb d phi. Okay, so the reason we do that is because we can find this change of momentum, this change that we had before, uh, we can also do that by uh, finding it, it's a impulse. So we can say that delta p is the integral from t equals minus infinity to plus infinity of the force on the particle as a function of time, right? Force is change in momentum over time. We integrate that, we get the impulse. Um, and in our case, we know that the force is Coulomb's law, and we're only going to worry about the y direction of it because we know that the x direction cancels. And so that ends up being uh, big Z little z e squared, that's the charge squared, uh, over 4 pi epsilon naught uh, times the integral from minus infinity to infinity cosine phi, that's the y component, over r squared, that's the Coulomb part, dt. Now, uh, it's useful to get rid of the dt over r and notice that dt uh, from our calculation before, we had dt is r squared vb, r squared over vb times d phi. So making that substitution, we find that this is z, z, e squared, 4 pi epsilon naught. The constant 1 over vb comes out. I have my integral. Uh, the cosine phi stays there. The r squared of in, uh, that I'm going to replace in the dt cancels the r squared that I had, so I just have cosine phi and d phi. Now, I have to find the limits. Uh, so at t is min minus infinity, uh, right, the particle's over here, and that's at this angle, negative phi goes down to there. This angle is, is theta over 2. So this is going to go from minus pi over 2 minus theta over 2. Uh, yeah. So the lower limit is minus pi over 2, 90 degrees, minus theta over 2. And then it goes to the symmetric side of that, so that's pi over 2 minus theta over 2 on the other side. Well, this is an integral I can do. Um, integral of cosine is sine. And so I'm going to have uh, sine uh, evaluated at minus pi minus theta over 2 to plus pi over 2 minus theta over 2. And sine, we know, uh, when you change the integrand, it changes sine. So that's just 2 times sine pi over 2 minus theta over 2. Sine of pi over 2 minus anything is cosine of that thing. So in the end, what I have is that this delta p is z z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over vb, 2 cosine theta over 2. And from before, I, all, I knew what that was. This also equals 2 mv sine theta over 2. And then I can see now I can relate b. I have the b factor here. I want to set b, move it over to one side, move everything else to the other side, and you'll note that I have 
a v here and a v there. So if I divide 2mv here, bring it over this side, I'm going to have 2mv squared. I can write, like, write that as an energy. And then I'm also going to bring the sine theta down on the other side. Uh, and so I'm going to have cosine over sine of theta over 2. That's going to be cotangent. So in the end, what I find is that d equals z, z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught. 1, there's an extra factor of 2 that I haven't accounted for. 1 over the kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy of the target particle, that is, times the cotangent of theta over 2. Okay, so then let's figure out the actual um, cross-section from this. So we started with um, a the B calculation, and so if we look at the beam head-on, uh, we'll find that you know B is some part off here, and it's going around in a circle like this, and if we add up all the part at a given B, we're going to find that this is 2 pi b uh, db. So there's some thickness db at a space db. Uh, that's a ring of some area that's part of our cross-section. So that's the cross-section going in, and it's going to scatter into some theta, uh, But and we're going to integrate all those phi's. So what we're going to have to divide this by is 2 pi sine theta d theta. Right? We've integrated over the phi's to do all that, and that this equals then d sigma d omega. Uh, and so what we see here is that we need to calculate db d theta, and then multiply by b and theta. So uh, doing that calculation then, db d theta, uh, okay, so just putting all the facts that come, the factors that come z, z, e squared, uh, over 8 pi epsilon naught, solve that factor of 2, 1 over the kinetic energy, and then the derivative of cotangent is cosecant squared, or and with a minus sign, so this is minus 1 over sine squared theta over 2, and then I can't forget that it's that would be derivative of cotangent theta, but it's cotangent theta over 2, so there's an extra factor of 2 from the chain rule. And so this, in fact, equals minus z, big Z, little z, e squared over 16 pi epsilon naught e kin uh, times uh, 1 over sine squared theta over 2. Okay, so now I can calculate d sigma d omega, uh, and I'm going to drop the minus sign because I don't really care about it. I don't really care about the proportionality, uh, not the fact that smaller b's go to larger thetas, which is what the minus sign represents. Uh, so d sigma d omega, then, well, I had a b db, so uh, I'm going to have a bunch of factors, and so I'm going to have uh, z, z, e squared, 8 pi, epsilon naught, 1 over e kin squared, that's 1 from b and 1 from db, uh, I'm going to have the e kin squared, one from b and one from eb. I'm going to have an extra factor of one half from db d, d theta. Uh, and then I'm going to have um, cosine theta over 2 over sine theta over 2. That's from b. 1 over sine squared theta over 2, 
from dB, and then one more factor of sine theta. That's just this factor here. Okay, so that all looks nice except to have one sine theta and a cosine theta. But then I can remember that sine theta is just sine of theta over 2 plus theta over 2, so it's double, and so that should be 2 sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2. And so I can just uh, make that change here. 2 sine theta over 2 cosine theta over 2. And then I can cancel those. And I find in the end that I have uh, z, z, e squared over 16 pi epsilon naught e kin squared. Oh, I see that I actually made a mistake and included e kin twice here, so this factor should go away. Okay, so that's all squared, and then I have 1 over sine to the fourth theta over 2. Uh, one other thing I can do, because uh, the units are kind of funny here, and I'm going to want to compare this later to, um, to a quantum mechanics calculation, uh, we're going to put it in terms of alpha, which is e squared over hc h bar c, but in this case we actually, it'll have the 4 pi epsilon naught in it as well, so that this in the end is going to equal uh, z z alpha over, take away the 4 pi, I'm left with 4 e kin, which is just 2 m v squared, square that, times 1 over sine to the fourth theta over 2. And just to be clear about what the equation is, let's remove that alpha definition. And so, while I'm at I'm going to rewrite this. Sine to the fourth theta over 2. Note, one last thing, uh, sine theta over 2 is related to the momentum transfer, so this is proportional to 1 over the momentum transfer to the fourth. This scheme where you split the, uh, the theta into two parts, theta over 2 on, on, the, on the beginning and, and the end, allows it allows one to do hard sphere scattering as well in this scheme. And here's a hard sphere, and you see the particle comes in and bounces off. You have equal angles of incidence and reflection, and you can easily do the hard uh, sphere scattering. You just have to figure out the relation of B to theta, and that's really not very hard uh, because uh, B is there in red as the radius that it comes in. The angles are the same, so that uh, B is just going to be uh, the radius of the sphere times cosine theta over 2. Uh, and you'll see that uh, when uh, theta is uh, close to 0, then B is very close to R. And when theta is close to pi over 2, which means you, the total when theta over 2 is pi over 2, theta is pi, you get a bounce back, then uh, b is 0. And from this, then, one can calculate the, uh, the cross-section, not Rutherford scattering, but hard sphere scattering, like we just did. Finally, we should make a, a mention of how to calculate the cross-section, uh, or at least hint at it, in quantum mechanics.
uh, we're going to use a lot of uh, uh, hand waving in this, but uh, we're going to start with Fermi's golden rule, which gives the rate of interactions uh, going from one state to another. Uh, and so Fermi's golden rule says that the rate of reactions, get the right pen color here, uh, the rate of reactions is 2 pi over h bar times the matrix element from the fine initial to the final state squared, and then times the density of final state energies. Uh, and so the part of this that you'll remember from your maybe from your quantum mechanics class, is this matrix element, which is an amplitude squared to give a probability. Uh, that's what gives you the rate of interactions. And so this is the numerator of the cross-section calculation. Remember that cross-section is the rate of interactions divided by the flux. We're not going to worry too much about the flux uh, in our calculation here. Uh, okay, so uh, just to zoom in on that, uh, matrix element. Uh, so that's, we can write in a number of ways. We can take a final state, say it operates on some Hamiltonian for the interaction, and we start with some initial state. So that's, uh, you know, initial state interacts, goes to a final state. Uh, in wave mechanics, we can write that same thing as the final state wave function as a function of R complex conjugate of it, the Hamiltonian interaction as a function of, of R, and the initial wave function of R. So uh, again, the initial state uh, interact overlaps via the Hamiltonian with the final state, and we have to do that integral over all space. Now, in our scattering cases, we want plane waves, and plane waves have psi of x proportional to e to the minus i k dot r. So k is the wave vector. It's uh, 1 over the wavelength in a given direction. So k tells you what direction you're going. And k dot r then gives you the wave going as you go along. And so initially and finally, uh, we have that. And so if we also assume the Born approximation and things just interact once, it'll be good enough for our purposes here, uh, we can say that uh, HFI uh, is integral over all space e to the plus i k prime dot r. k prime is the final state uh, wave vector. Uh, and then we, we, they just interact via the potential uh, and the initial state e to the i k dot r integrated over all space. Now, uh, it'll be useful to put this in terms of the momentum transfer. And so we're going from k to k prime in direction. The momentum transfer just needs a, an h bar times that. And so we can say that q is h bar times k prime minus k. That's the momentum transfer to the particle between the initial state and the final state. And making that notation, then, uh, we can combine the two exponentials, and we get v of r e to the i over h bar q dot r d 3r. That's an r vector. And this, in fact, is a Fourier transform in three-dimensional space. So you have this Fourier transform term of the potential. And so we could say that what we get out of that is in fact just the potential in terms of momentum transfer. But we can actually do the Fourier transform as well. Uh, v has, you know, z's and e's in it and everything. Also, it's spherically symmetric, so there's going, if we do the integral over all space, we're actually going to do it in spherical coordinates. What we find is that this, in fact, will equal z, big Z, little z, e squared times 4 pi h bar squared, h bar squared, uh, divided by q squared. And if we recall that q, the magnitude of q, is 2p sine theta over 2, you'll see that q squared 
is going to be proportional to sine squared theta over 2, and we need to square this matrix element, so we're going to have sine squared theta over 4 in the denominator. And in fact, the quantum mechanic uh, calculation from all this gives exactly the same thing as the classical case. d sigma d omega is z z alpha h bar squared h bar c over 2 mv squared, all of that squared, times 1 over sine to the fourth theta over 2.